you use that one. You turn it off. This one's live right now, so I'll turn that one. Okay. Uh, welcome to session two, which is on applications and use cases for artificial intelligence in health. Uh, I'm Markus Wenzel. I'm from Fraunhofer in Berlin, Germany, and I work in uh, the machine learning group there. And I also support the operations of the focus group. Um, in this session, we have four great talks. So two speakers are already here. One is still in the in the underground. Where, the, where they have a power problem, but Paul promised me that he will be here on time. And uh, I don't know if Nages is is here. Great. Yeah, if you want, you you're welcome to to join the other speakers here. Um, I'm very curious about the session. We will learn how AI can be applied to radiology, to ophthalmology to psychiatry, or, and also we will learn how AI, AI can be used to predict diseases from electronic health records. And uh, from a machine learning perspective, we will deal with 3D images, so radiology voxels with 2D images, pixels with time series, and also that I'm especially curious about with unstructured electronic health records, which is probably even more, more complicated. Um, so each speaker will have 10 minutes of time, then we will have one or two questions. And you're very welcome to use Pit and Hall um, to get involved. You can post the questions, upload the most relevant ones. And um, so the talks, will, we will have one, one hour about for, for the talks then still 15 minutes for more in-depth discussions. And where's my slide, actually? Uh, um, okay, doesn't matter. Um, so let's start with uh, the first talk. By Geraldine McGinty. She's a um, radiologist from Well Connell Medicine, and she has a, a profound interest in AI. And she was recommended to me because she gave a great keynote in Spain at a machine learning conference. Uh, so uh, let's open the stage for Geraldine, and she will speak about um, fostering a strong ecosystem for AI in. Thank you, medical imaging, right? Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Is that correct? Should be there. No? Here. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much. I am, uh, full disclosure, I'm not, uh, I have nothing to disclose other than I'm not a data scientist. I'm a practicing radiologist who does breast imaging and uh, currently um, chair of the board of the American College of Radiology. I'll talk a little bit more about who we are as an organization and why we think we should have a place at this table. And um, we really, in the radiology community, far from being worried about this uh, disruption and innovation making us obsolete, we are very excited about the possibilities. We think this is a really once in a lifetime, I would say, opportunity to improve patient care and improve the value of the care that we deliver. Um, you know, in my world, we've gone from x-ray, plain x-rays that we hang on a light bulb, light box, to um, the newest innovation that we have at Wild Cornell is a room that does PET scanning, MRI scanning, and angiography, all in one room. So this is the kind of innovation that I think we're looking at with artificial intelligence, but not, not because artificial intelligence is going to replace human radiologists, but rather um, because it's going in the same way as in the mid-19th century, we saw human productivity dramatically improved by the Industrial Revolution and the, the introduction, introduction of machines into manufacturing. With this, the same kind of innovation, we are going to improve what we can do with our human brains. As a community, though, we are concerned about the risks of getting this wrong. We don't, unfortunately, yet see this as 
a community that is moving together in lockstep, and, and that's, that's inevitable, right? Um, but whether it's through misalignment of, of financial incentives, whether it's through some caution in the, in, the in the medical community, or just the complexity of our healthcare system, especially here in the United States, and the relatively fragmented nature of how we deliver care, we are concerned about you know, what we might call an AI winter, you know? Um, and we have some lessons from our own history as radiologists. So, um, you know, we've been rapid innovators and adopters of technology, but not always without risk. So, um, going back to the birth of our specialty, lateral part of the 19th century, 1895, we have Redkin and Tesla essentially around the same time discovering the X-ray. And so, um, the first X-ray is obviously of Redkin's wife's hand. Four months later, this X-ray. Um, Sorry, this x-ray is taken in a small town in Ohio. It's a judge with a nail or a, uh, a twig through his hand. Interestingly, a 40-minute x-ray exposure, uh, a collaboration between the, uh, the physician and the physicist. But no innovation without consequence. And just a little tidbit here, which is that Rankin himself never allowed, he never allowed himself to be x-rayed. He's a stress of the technology, but Madame Curie, far from that, just celebrated the 100-year uh, anniversary of the armistice, and she died of a radiation-induced malignancy because when she took her X-ray-enabled ambulances onto the battlefield, they were not shielded. So, and not just that, we saw radium being used for face cream and hair dye. It's been a long journey for, to get to where we are now, which is that we are strongly focused on appropriate imaging. We're often saying, don't do any imaging at all. So. Um, you know, there's a lot that we have to be cautious about. We've been talking about this concept of an ecosystem, and for many of us lay people, I would say, Apple, I think, is the example that we come to. They're not a trillion-dollar company because they make phones. They're a trillion-dollar company because they've built an ecosystem around the technology that they, that they um, sell. But we, the very important difference, obviously, is that while Apple and the wonderful people who work there and the people who use their products Really, the primary responsibility there is shareholder value. We have a very different responsibility as physicians, right? We swear an oath to protect our patients. So when we're creating an ecosystem, it's around our patients. The ACR is the uh, American College of Radiology, actually about 38,000 members now. Um, and we have a core purpose to serve our patients. We do a lot of advocacy work and quality work. And you know, we know what it is that we've challenged ourselves to do in healthcare. We want to provide a better experience of care with our patients, better population health, more cost-effective care. We've got to do that in the US. And we also want to protect the health and well-being of those of us who deliver care to our patients. So you know, we are, as radiologists, I say we're not frightened of this. We have innovated many, many times, not just with the technology of the images we produce and read, but also the technology around that, remote reading, electronic transfer of images. And we see artificial intelligence as another tool to help us give better care to our patients. We are anxious for all of you in the community to think beyond some of the perhaps simplistic ideas of we can detect a lung nodule better than uh, a radiologist. There is so much administrative complexity in what we do, especially here in the US. Protocol selection, scheduling, getting results out, billing, compliance. Please think expansively about how we can pull those costs out of the system, again, to divert more resources towards the patients that we serve. We have had to do a little work in making sure that our radiologists are reassured. We've heard stories of medical school deans telling, res telling trainees not to go into uh, radiology because there'll be no jobs for them. And this hype has been pretty relentless. Um, there have also been some high-profile missteps, I think, and I know that, you know, if there's anyone from IBM in the room, I know this was a learning experience at, at MD Anderson, but it was a lot of money, $65 million, and perhaps not the, the, the results that everyone had hoped for. Just down the road here, my colleagues at Memorial, I think some of the norms about how we perceive um, patient data to be protected or who owns it are going to change. If you look back at the Henrietta Lacks affair, how that was propagated seems horrifying to us now. Let's think forward and think about how that's going to feel when we think about digital data and who, who owns it, who protects it, and who curates it. Okay. So this is, this is our catchphrase. 
Uh, and Kurt Langlotz, who's at Stanford, I think, coined this. Radiologists will not be replaced by AI, but radiologists who use AI will certainly replace those who don't. I'm not going to go through these in detail, but in the program, but there are so many ways that we are looking for your community to help us provide better care to our patients, whether it's in image interpretation, which I think is the obvious one, but patient care and safety, um, you know, and, and in efficiency of care. Optimization, I mean, so many opportunities, um, you know, quality improvement opportunities, patient, uh, patient care opportunities. As radiologists, we're always looking to do better. We hope that we're better than random, right? We hope that, that, that uh, we're better than 50%, but with better training, better equipment, we're pushing ourselves up into that perfect classifier role where we can always detect disease and never detect any, never cause any false positives. So again, looking to AI to help that. And as a breast imager who mostly uh, reads images on asymptomatic patients, I am looking to find disease when it's early enough to be cured or treated more effectively and with less morbidity to the patient. So help push me up that hill. Um, we, I think, are appropriately cautious. We are not particularly comfortable with the notion of a black box. If I'm standing in the neonatal, neonatal ICU, in front of two terrified patient parents, and I'm telling them whether their premature baby has, a, has an intraventricular hemorrhage that's going to result in significant disability or not, and I'm using your algorithm to do that, I want to know how comfortable you are that, you, that you, you're right, and how much I can trust you. We use tools all the time that are not perfect, but we need to know the extent to which we can rely on your tool. And, you know, I won't go into this, you all know this, we've seen multiple examples of where we perhaps need to be somewhat critical in trusting this. And I'm not going to read these, but we have so many complex decisions when we, that we make when we interpret images. What else do we know about this patient? What do we know about the equipment they were scanned on? Or the other comorbidities they have? And specifically when you're thinking about data sets, it is not just, does this person have a meniscal tear or not? It's how old is this patient? What's their ethnic background? Um, what degree of pathology are we looking for? How did we image this? Was it ultrasound? Was it MR? Even if it's on the same equipment with two data sets, what was the vendor? What was the sequence that we chose? We need diverse data sets. We're looking, obviously, to, to have this be something we can use in our work. Cody oh, referenced the Mackay talk, and that's an important relationship for us. But we want to be in this ecosystem with you. We want you to be talking to us about what it is that we need um, to do our job better. And we have, I think, a long history. It was the ACR that was really a leader in um, pushing the DICOM standard forward. We are very comfortable with registries and benchmarking our data. So uh, we would love to be involved in this process. And we think that we do have an important role as a professional society. This, economic theory of the tragedy of the commons where we potentially risk overfishing the space and not really getting anything meaningful out, I think really speaks to the importance of organizations like yours and ours in, uh, in driving this the right way. So we established our Data Science Institute last year. It's been very busy, obviously, um, articulating the role that we have been hoped to continue to have, but most importantly, protecting our patients leveraging industry and building this ecosystem and also educating our community about uh, what it is that we hope to do. And with all of the things that we could get involved in, we've chosen to focus on use cases. Um, we've just uh, published 50 use cases and invested by industry. They're out there open source, basically a standardized format for helping us frame these questions. Um, clearly, you know, very focused on patient safety and appropriateness of care, free of bias, um, and as I say, those use case uh, templates are available. We would love to see those um, uh, getting traction. At the end of the day, it's about taking the things that we think are important or that puzzle us, matching them with the things that AI can help with so that we actually can improve care. So I'll just leave you with the fact that we in the radiology community firmly believe this will persistently improve care. It's not about replacing radiologists but really about putting all the data together in this ecosystem to deliver better care. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting talk. I think we have time for, for one question from the audience. Then we will look into the pigeon hall. Um, is there a question to Geraldine right now? 
Thank you. Uh, my name is Jack, and I'm Charles Medicine Doctor and Research Fellow. Um, I noticed your attention to administrative informatics, and I was wondering what your thoughts were about how people in tech talk about what ground truth or choose the ground truth that they use. Do you think it should evolve based on the methods and the maturity? Uh -huh. And so, what I think of is the filming or the scheduling should be used first to prove a basic level of proficiency before clinical. Gosh, I, I would I don't think I would have the hubris to, to, to really decide, say that we could decide that, but I think that healthcare is conservative and healthcare IT is conservative and a large healthcare system like ours, we have to keep the trains running. We don't have the option to, as Mark Zuckerberg said, fail fast. We can't fail. So I do think that, that taking out some of that administrative burden and showing that you can make it work would, can certainly help build confidence um, in the ability of your of your tool to do what it says it's going to do. And we sometimes feel a little constrained because we aren't able to innovate and bring in new new products because we have to keep our electronic health record, you know, running well at all times. Sometimes if we can if we can work on administrative data, I think we can show that it's possible and, and build confidence. It's in the pigeon hall. Uh, no question. Um, well, one quick, quick question. It's actually not a question. Uh, it's, very quick, huh? uh, it's a request. Yes, can we have access to the slides? It's wonderful. I think they're in the program. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> and then I have one question because um, so the idea is here to to create this. Um, benchmarking framework on a best practice approach. So if we have one good example, for example, from the radiology field, mm -hmm. and then it could get traction and uh, we can spread it um, across the 50 use cases you mentioned. So what is the most promising, simple one with the most leverage to start with? Gosh, there, I mean, there are a lot of them out there. One of the ones that um, has been, I think, well, obviously, lung nodules are pretty much um, they're there. There's been a lot of work in lung nodules. Another one that I think is out there is bone age. We use a, stat, a reference um, to determine whether um, children have growth delay, um, and that one I think is is quite well established too. But we can yeah. connect offline on that. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Um, I think we should continue. Um, our next speaker is Arun Shroff. He's um, the co-founder and CTO of MedIndia, and he's the director of innovations and research at Star Associates. And he will um, introduce us to a use case from ophthalmology and how AI can be used to prevent vision loss for millions globally. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marcus. Uh, Good morning, everyone. Uh, great to be here today. Uh, and uh, um, I uh, would like to thank the ITU and the WHO for giving me this opportunity to present today. Uh, I had originally presented on this topic at the AI for the Global Summit in Geneva in May. And at that point, it was just a concept and a proposal. And today, I'm going to recap some of that talk. So bear with me if you already seen some of these slides. But I'm also going to share our journey since then. We made considerable progress, and I hope to show you some of that today. So uh, the problem or the uh, challenge that we decided to take upon ourselves was basically, you know, the many many problems we had been solved. So one of the problems we identified, which we felt, has uh, you know, it's a low hanging fruit with a lot of possible impact globally, is diabetic retinopathy. Uh, diabetic retinopathy is basically a disease, as many of you may know, a complication of diabetes that damages the retina and leads to vision impairment and possible vision loss. And uh, today, DR, or diabetic retinopathy, is the leading cause of blindness among working age adults worldwide. So it, it is a big problem. And of course, the reason why diabetic uh, retinopathy is a problem is, of course, because of the diabetes epidemic. 
As for the WHO, there are 422 million people worldwide who suffer from diabetes. This was in 2015. The number is probably much larger today. A full 35% of these people have some form of DR, as per the WHO estimates. That's 148 people. 11%, 46 million people have advanced form of DR, which is the kind of DR that would lead to vision loss. Of course, we go forward to 2040, the numbers become even much larger and more long. But definitely, diabetic retinopathy is a global challenge. It's the kind of challenge that we can see AI and technology helping us. <coughs> so, uh, one of the uh, key things that you need to remember is that you cannot cure or reverse diabetic retinopathy. Uh, by the way, as a disclaimer, I'm not an ophthalmologist. <laughs> I'm a computer science AI expert. But I've learned a little bit about VR, working with a lot of the people in the model. So if I use some of the terms incorrectly, this will get me. But VR essentially uh, needs to be detected early. And if you can detect it early enough, you can treat it. There's possible options available. The problem is it's not that easy to detect. Now, how is it detected today? The process looks somewhat similar to this. Uh, uh, you know, a trained eye care professional examines you using an equipment similar to this called a fundus camera. Uh, they imagine, they, they examine the back of your retina, take a color photograph, a color fundus photograph, and then they examine the photograph for lesions and abnormalities that signify the state of the DR. So you could have early onset, early mild, moderate, severe, or you know, the last label is PDR. As you can see, this process is a manual process. It's time consuming. It requires expensive equipment and a lot of expertise. Um, now, this is the kind of problem as you know, I'm sure all of you are familiar with, is typically the kind of problem that AI today is solving well. Um, but we'll come to that a little later. The problem is that the expertise and the equipment that we need is a short supply in many parts of the world. So this is a map of the distribution of the knowledges worldwide. The uh, likely shade of regions which are mostly in Africa and Asia, as you can see, have a huge shortage of not only equipment, but of ophthalmologists. Just to highlight, a few countries in Africa, Somalia, Angola, they have less than 20 ophthalmologists for a country with population of 20 to 30 million people. So there's no possible way you can screen everybody at risk in these countries. In India, with 1.3 million people, we have only 15,000 ophthalmologists. I mean, even if you double or triple that number, you're not going to have enough people to screen everybody at risk. So this is a difficult problem, and it definitely needs innovative technology solutions. <coughs> so how can AI help? Well, as you've all heard from a lot of the talks earlier, as well as later on today, this is the kind of problem that's kind of low-hanging fruit for AI. You could use deep learning CNNs, you know, convolutional neural networks, uh, feed the image on the left and get an output on the right. Uh, you know, in terms of the, the, the AI will not only give you a diagnosis, it will give you a probability of the confidence of the diagnosis, as you can see on the right. And, you know, this has been studied quite a bit in the last few years. Uh, a lot of algorithms have been published, a lot of studies have been done. Google in 2016 published uh, a result of their uh, AI detection algorithm with an accuracy of 0.95, which was superior to the average. Uh, accuracy of you know eight ophthalmologists. So this is a problem that AI can solve. The problem is you know it's not enough to just uh, have uh, an algorithm. You know as an entrepreneur you need to make this, you, you need to create a full end-to-end -end solution. So we when we set out uh, you know to, we, we took on this challenge we listed a list of objectives or criteria for you know what the solution ought to look like, and these are listed very quickly here. Uh, it needs to be an end-to-end -end solution. It needs to meet all the medical standards, obviously, for accuracy. Uh, it needs to be something that you can uh, deploy remotely. You know, as you saw, we need to do this in regions in Africa and Asia where they just don't have access to infrastructure. It needs to be scalable. You know, you need to do this for hundreds of thousands of images and patients, possibly. Obviously, you need to comply with local laws and regulations. 
it needs to be on top of all this portable, low cost, easy to deploy, use and maintain. So, you know, it's not just uh, the AI technology, the core algorithm, but you need to worry about all of these things as well. Uh, so, uh, this is a quick overview of what we proposed, and I'll just walk you through the different parts of the submission here. Uh, you start with the image capture using a fundus camera or a low cost device like a smartphone in a remote clinic or a streaming kiosk. The image is uploaded uh, you know, via an internet connection to the cloud to an AI based uh, AI uh, server running in, you know, in the cloud. The AI server uh, you know, quickly, within a couple of seconds, does an analysis of the image and sends a diagnosis, the results of the diagnosis, either to a remote ophthalmologist who can view and validate this uh, diagnosis or it could go directly to the patient uh, in the future when this uh, solution actually gets certified for, uh, uh, for diagnostic accuracy. Uh, the uh, model is also built so that the, uh, you know, as you're building this data from the ophthalmologist, they can validate if there's an incorrect diagnosis, the model can continuously improve. So, you know, we've built that in so that the training data set keeps constantly getting refined and, you know, keeps improving. So, you know, when we took on this challenge, obviously as technologists, as I said, we're technologists, we're not uh, ophthalmologists. We decided we would like to partner with somebody who, who's actually doing this professionally. So we have a partnership right now, since we may, with this National Tele Ophthalmology Group in India. They have 275 centers in 22 states. They are doing 25,000 patients a month. 50 to 100,000 images are being screened by them each month using a remote network of actual ophthalmologists. So what we did was, you know, they wanted to scale this up and they decided to work with us and, you know, we used their data to do the AI training and you managed to reach pretty good levels of accuracy right now, close to, you know, between 88 and 90 percent. Of course, the sensitivity and specificity of that particular uh, diagnostic is also within very big acceptable limits. Uh, we also integrated our cloud-based AI solution with your whole the workflow. So it's a complete end-to-end -end solution as we were planning to do originally. And right now, this is in data trial in India. So this is a quick a peek behind you know, how our AI model actually works. So this is actually looking at you know, how the software actually looks when you start using it. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's hosted on a secure uh, web server. Uh, you know, the uh, operator at the clinic would log in. They would then enter all the patient information. They would be able to upload the retinal images. Uh, of course, all of this is, you know, being done through a browser, being done through a smartphone with an internet connection from anywhere or from a remote clinic. Uh, the moment the uh, AI, uh, the moment the retina images are uploaded, uh, the AI comes back with the diagnosis. As of right now, you're limited it, keep it simple, and for testing, just to three different categories. In India, you remember that we don't use high resolution fundus cameras. And you know, a lot of the there's a lot of human error involved in terms of the image processing itself. So we have a category called non-gradable, which means those images cannot be uh, cannot be uh, diagnosed by even a human being. And so the non readable category, believe it or not, is a significant part of the data that we got. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So if it's non readable, the operator will be alerted immediately. They could retake the image. That alone saves them a lot of processing time and improves the throughput. The second category is retinopathy. And of course, the third, I mean, I mean, normal or retinopathy. Retinopathy, we haven't split it into the different uh, diagnoses yet. We plan to do that later on. So this is a close-up of what it looks like. Uh, the AI actually comes back with a list of probabilities that it makes, you know, the similar marks in that category. Um, so, uh, quickly talk now, a little bit of time, uh, on the challenges that we face doing this. The first challenge, of course, the AI model, as we all know, is data. And, you know, the AI model is just as good as the data. The quantity and the quality. We had a lot of, we had a huge quantity of data. There was no, no, no shortage of data. We had over 100,000 images. But in the initial training runs, we realized that there was something wrong. The training was not going past a certain level of accuracy. We quickly realized there were a lot of 
red external images of the retina, uh, external images of the eye, the anterior uh, images being mixed in with the posterior images, we become an error. And then when we examine it, we realize that this is not going to work. So, you know, we, we actually then decided to take out those images. This is like 15 to 20 percent of the data out of 120,000 images. That's quite a bit. It took been time considering to do this manually. So we actually created another AI model to clean the data. <laughs> we, and you know, it turns out this is a much easier job than doing the DR detection. I mean, we got 100 percent accuracy in detecting eyes. It's a simple problem. So we use that initially to kind of pre-process and clean the data using the AI itself. The uh, low resolution or focus images were not our problem because that's part of the model. We need to be able to you know, fix that with the non aspect aspects of the AI. The second uh, challenge that we have to tackle is the scale of the resolution. And there we have some help. Uh, you know, we have experience running live websites, so evidence of uh, visitors right now, so we use some of that expertise. But we also have access to all these different beautiful frameworks and tools, uh, which are listed here. We, we also hosted the solution on Amica made of US, so that you know, it's scalable, you can handle any amount of data you like it, any amount of processing power. Uh, of course, the most important part was the compliance with not only the medical standards, benchmarking, but privacy and security of data and the legal and medical regulations is the health application of this. So we have to comply with all of those. And you know, we're working on all these different aspects, but I'll quickly touch upon the standards and benchmarking because this is what focus group is all about. So we've internally validated a lot of our models with the uh, you know ground truth from the internal validation has been okay, but now we need to go out and do this external validation. That's where working with the focus group on the for health is going to be very, very helpful. Um, we also, of course, made sure that we followed the best practices in terms of privacy and security, informed consent, confidentiality, and so on of the data, uh, and you know, using encryption and anonymization and so on. Uh, and of course, as we move along, we're going to make sure that it also certified, it's also certified by the appropriate regulatory authorities in India and the US. Um, one other challenge which I mentioned here, by the way, these slides are a little bit messed up, I'm sorry. Uh, the lettering is. But anyway, uh, the, 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 one of the uh, criteria, as you, as, as you saw on the initial slide, was that we wanted to make sure that the solution was portable. So one big constraint, of course, is you can't take this large, bulky equipment into the field. So we have to come up with a way to do this uh, image capture using a portable device. Smartphone cameras have better resolution than some of these fundus camera images, but they're not yet clinically approved. So one of the challenges we're also trying to solve is create a smartphone-based device, which is handheld, costs actually a couple of hundred bucks, actually. <coughs> so we're working on a prototype to be able to do that. Hopefully that should be ready for the next meeting. Um, so next steps quickly, uh, we are going to finish beta testing and do a field trials of the software that's already been done, complete the smartphone based imaging device, validate against external standards and benchmarks, obtain all the required certifications. We all obviously you know, welcome any partners who, who want to collaborate with us uh, to deploy this in other areas, other regions of the world. And we always an entrepreneur looking to scale it up. We look for funding and you know resources, even though this has been funded initially before bootstrap, and you know with angel funding. And I just like to conclude with this quote because uh, you know we believe that it's feasible to use AI to solve this global healthcare challenge of detecting that retinopathy early, and that would be to prevent blindness for millions. And that I think would truly be AI for them. Thank you all, and uh, welcome to the questions. Really impressive project, and I'm, I'm looking forward to hear about the project maybe Thank you. The next time we have. So, any questions? I mean, you want me to stay on? I guess. Um, I think we, um, uh, we, have, we, we can have a look in the. Um, I see there's something in the kitchen hall. This Here, Marcus. Okay, thank you. So, did, did the Arabic eye clinic influence the choice of this project or your ambitions with it? If so, please share your insights. Um, 
Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, you know, we actually we are familiar with uh, the uh, not the Irwin Irwin has I was familiar with them. Just directly. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm doing we, it now. I'm doing it now. We, cool. we are we do we are working with yeah, if you want, uh, you can the last one, the model, which does work with them, and uh, the other one is the Elmi Prasad Eye Institute in Hyderabad, which is very well known. They have something similar going on. In fact, they they have this prototype. The small imaging device that they created, which is handheld. So we, we know the uh, founder, uh, Dr. Nath Rao, very well. So we're going to be working with them. There's a lot of work being done actually in Andhra Pradesh, which is where uh, Elu Prasad I Institute is based, which they are working with the Andhra government, and we are actually part of the project. Okay. I, I have a. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So Gabriela, another entrepreneur in the visual health um, field as well. So. Um, I would like to know what are your ideas for commercializing this? Um, what would be your business model? Would you sell to governments or the, to the private sector? Who would be here like, quickly? Well, uh, right now, this is like a commercial uh, you know, venture, uh, but it has obviously I talked to, I think, some of the folks here in the last uh, you know, meeting at uh, Geneva that you know, we'd like to also use some of this uh, for good in countries like Africa. So we need to come up with a better business model than what we have. Right now, uh, you know, we, 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 we would like to, for example, launch this in places in Africa. I think we'll have a lot of that's where That's what is driving this, actually, in a way. And if there are, uh, we are more than happy to work with NGOs and, you know, funds uh, who can, you know, deploy the necessary resources and, you know, use local partners in those areas to do that. I mean, each, the model is going to be different depending on which region we're at. Let's put it that way. But still, someone has to pay for it. So yeah, I know, I know. So right now, you know, we 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 managed to build. I mean, as an entrepreneur, I've built a lot of different companies using, you know, I mean, bootstrapping, and you can do a lot with very little now in technology. So we managed to do this so far, but to go to the next level, we definitely let's we'll, we'll, we'll see some support. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I see there's still some interest in the audience. Um, I would like to postpone it to, to the end of the session and um, to keep what the schedule and introduce the next uh, speaker. He's uh, Paul Scheider. He's a professor at Columbia for um, biomedical engineering and electrical <coughs> engineering and also radiology from a physics perspective. And um, I'm curious uh, for your talk. It's about rehabilitating the mind using AI to track and treat mental illness. So, thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Is there a okay. So, um, I wanted to just take you through a little bit of the work that we've been doing, um, looking at uh, using AI to uh, to help treat and track mental illness. Um, Anyway, so mental illness uh, in itself, if you think of the, the cost of uh, mental illness worldwide, these are numbers just for the U.S. It's really um, the most costly disorder or uh, disease, disease that we're confronted with. I mean, this number two is cardiovascular disease, um, and, uh, and therefore it has you know, quite a bit of economic cost. It's got cost in terms of quality of life, uh, morbidity, and, and even uh, mortality. Uh, and you know, there have been a number of worldwide brain initiatives in the EU, in Asia, in the United States, where part of these initiatives, the, the rationale between uh, for starting these initiatives was to build technologies and, and really new types of platforms to better understand not just brain function, but how one can uh, have an effect on both neurological and psychiatric conditions. So the goal is really to, in the long term, make a major impact in improving how we treat, track, and deal with mental illness. Now, um, you know, we've heard a little bit about radiology, ophthalmology, a lot of 
uh, of the clinical disciplines that use imaging. Uh, neurology is another uh, discipline that uses imaging. And we think about neurology as you know, this branch of, um, of medicine that deals with the nervous system. And, and neurology is really good, for instance, at using imaging. This is just an example of some magnetic resonance spectroscopy imaging. Algorithms, AI, uh, pattern analysis are, are typically used in this domain. Um, psychiatry, on the other hand, which still deals with the nervous system, but from the concept of the mind, um, really doesn't isn't that sophisticated at the moment in terms of how it uses advanced technology to really better understand what's the underlying um, symptoms and um, and uh, causes of uh, mental illness. Uh, there's been probably in the last few years an increase in activity in the area of AI and using um, AI type tools to kind of play the role of a coach or, or therapist. And um, some pretty high profile companies, this is Wallbot, which uh, the chairman of the board is Andrew Inge, who's really an AI pioneer. And, um, and the idea here is that this would increase your access to, uh, to therapy, or, um, particularly, let's say, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, but it still really looks at the problem of a mental illness tracking, mental illness as a low-tech problem in terms of really uh, reports from the patient themselves directly um, or maybe indirectly through their interactions in the environment. What I wanted to talk about today is just some of the work that's possible when we look at some technology enablers that have been um, progressing and developing over the last several years. Um, machine learning and AI is, is obviously critical in this area, um, but also critical is the increase in our ability to uh, image the brain using different modalities, essentially seeing different facets of the structure, activation, anatomy of the brain and, and using, um, in many cases, AI techniques to fuse those into a picture of, um, of the function and mental health of an individual. Um, and then the other thing to, to really put out there is that some of this technology is, is um, ultimately enabling uh, closed loop control and intervention in therapy. So uh, some of the work uh, we do, and I won't go into the details, lack of time today is once you have uh, the ability to, let's say, make inferences about brain state, let's say using AI, um, can you deliver precise intervention control uh, to uh, the individual, either through some type of you know, uh, behavioral intervention or even a, a intervention that stimulates part of the brain, so neuromodulatory or neurostimulation. And, and this allows um, kind of personalized um, delivery of uh, therapy in mental health and mental illness. And there's a lot of really compelling applications here, particularly those that, uh, that are, are suffering with um, major uh, mental uh, illness um, disorders. Uh, I won't have time to go through the different things that we've been working on. Um, these are just a, a, a list. One is complicated grief disorder. Actually, I'm going to talk about that as an example, so I won't go in, into that right here. Um, we've done quite a bit of work looking at um, targeted networks in obsessive compulsive disorder, so looking using multiple types of neuroimaging and AI and machine learning to identify the networks that underlie OCD and then use that to kind of target network activity either through uh, stimulation using deep brain stimulation or non-invasive stimulation such as transcranial magnetic stimulation. We also have been uh, looking at uh, major depressive disorder, perhaps the, the most prevalent um, uh, uh, mental illness disorder at least in the U.S. and looking at uh, a closed loop um, personalized neuromodulatory treatment. Uh, some of you might know that TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, is approved by the FDA for treating um, major depressive disorder. Uh, and we're looking to uh, online track uh, biomarkers of certain brain activity and deliver precisely in time this, uh, this TMS stimulation to maximize the efficacy of the treatment. So 
Uh, just real quickly in terms of an example of uh, how we use AI and machine learning, what I'm going to talk about is an example not where we could necessarily replace a therapist or um, you know, kind of do the same thing a therapist might be able to do or a psychiatrist, but perhaps provide more information that is really impossible to infer from just, let's say, a, a cognitive behavioral therapy session. So uh, complicated grief disorder is actually uh, an interesting disorder that typically results um, after somebody undergoes a, 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 a severe grieving experience or incident. Oftentimes, for instance, a, a close a loved one commits suicide. Um, that causes uh, significant grieving. If that grieving uh, manifests itself over a prolonged period of time, um, it becomes complicated grief, and it's comorbid with depression, anxiety, and so forth. And, and the current standard of treatment is psychotherapy. Um, the goal is to really think about the loss, the individual, that relationship, the expectations associated with that relationship, and try to deal and restructure one's life within the context of the reality of the death. Um, we believe, and, and the, the, the field believes, at least a hypothesis, is there's some underlying oscillation between the individual engaging with the, the mental process of thinking about that individual that was lost, and then also avoiding or suppressing those thoughts. And we actually see parallels between this type of loss and loss of, let's say, a limb. So when you lose a limb, there's phantom limb, there's pain, there's all this uh, associated um, not just physical pain but mental pain and we think that part of the remodeling the brain needs to do when it loses something extremely close whether it's you know a, an arm or a child is this remodeling process that involves these, these different components um, so what we wanted to do was look at this within the context of a, of a patient cohort I'm not going to go through all the details but the idea was we wanted to to build an AI model, essentially a machine learning model, that allowed us to look at interactions of brain activity with thoughts of the deceased. And so um, we created this, what's called a Stroop experiment. Those of you that are, uh, know about psych uh, psychology might know the classic example is when you have uh, words green and red, and if the color of those is congruent with what the word is, you tend to respond faster than if it's not congruent, like in these cases. Um, you can create those in multiple different domains. Like you can uh, create those when the congruency has to do with whether that individual is in fact um, the name of the individual who, let's say, committed suicide. And you can image the brain while individuals are doing this task and try to identify the patterns that represent those thoughts, those interfering um, processes that actually slow the behavior and the reaction. <laughs> now the point of that is that's a set of training data that allows us to build this model. But what we wanted to do was say once we have this model, how do we how do we apply it um, during a process where they're essentially just free thinking? They, they might be thinking about um, you know the individual, they might not, and so uh, we take that model and we use that decode the information um, about this pattern expression. So it's one of the key things here is we're actually using uh, machine learning to identify these networks, these very broad um, kind of uh, patterns across the, uh, the cortex. And we look at the end of, let's say, five or ten minutes, we ask the individual, did you think about uh, the, the, the person who committed suicide or not? Um, and so we apply that, and at the same time with the, the, the uh, resulting report, we get an output or an estimate from our model about whether or not the brain activity represents them thinking about that individual. And in fact, here what we did is we looked at only those um, time, uh, those trials or those uh, times in which they indicated they, they didn't think consciously about the individual. So in some sense, we're looking at times where they wouldn't report to a therapist, they didn't report to us that they thought of the individual. Um, however, we in those times, we also uh, looked in particular at how the brain activity uh, indicated whether or not there was a pattern indicating that they were in fact thinking about the individual. And what we found, which we thought was uh, kind of really exciting, is 
that there's this correlation between how much this expression of this pattern about thinking about the individual, even though it's, it's unconscious because they don't report it, um, correlates with a clinical score. This is what's called the inventory of complicated grief. So the higher this score, um, the, uh, you know, essentially the, the more there is in terms of um, the symptoms that indicate they are undergoing complicated grief, and uh, this axis indicates kind of the expression of that pattern. And so here what we find is that there's this marker in their unconscious thought. So they can't report this directly, but in this unconscious thought, that, that predicts extremely well this clinical score. So this starts to tell us a little bit about um, kind of some markers that we might be able to identify and infer, infer using machine learning applied to these kind of very rich neuroimaging data sets across time that might be better predictors of clinical variables than their actual self-reports. So we might be able to get a better idea of are they truly um, in a, uh, a good mode of recovering from grief, not just simply by what they're reporting in terms of their therapy sessions, but in terms of uh, underlying dynamics in brain activity. Um, and we think this is important because we can potentially map this into things like closed-loop intervention, um, habit training, things of that nature to provide new, new modes of therapeutic treatment which promote not just conscious changes, so kind of, you know, what something like a, a robot coach or a, or a, or a psychotherapist might uh, help us with, but even unconscious remodeling of thought patterns that help us deal with um, some of the symptoms and effects of complicated grief. Uh, so with that, I'll just stop, uh, acknowledge uh, some of my funders and also colleagues. Thank you very much. That was very interesting, especially that I've seen here um, at the last slide the name of Stefan Haufe. He was in, in the lab where I did my PhD also about closed loop ET analysis. Um, Thank you. So let's look back in, in the um, vision hall, and I want to encourage everyone. So sorry for cutting down one question. Please um, post your question there. That's not the last round. Um, but there's no, is there a new one? There's nothing. No. There's nothing. Okay. Then here. Yeah. I, I'm oh, wait one second. I give you the mic. <laughs> Somebody's faster than me. Okay. Hello. So. Um, representing the Department of Psychiatry at Columbia, and we are here, and thank you, Paul, for that. You know, what's interesting in psychiatry, what are some of the best year for research? What's interesting is it's not only in terms of sort of treatment processes, but in psychiatry we have that. So I'm, I'm very interested to hear, you guys have, you know what you're looking for. Now you're applying in radiology and ophthalmology. Now you're applying technology to make it faster, better, more efficient. In psychiatry we have a bigger problem, because we, in many cases, don't yet know what we're looking for, right? We're trying to find objective ways to diagnose our psychiatric illnesses. And in many cases, we're hoping that brain profiles will give us that information that we do not have now, so that we can then get into the pipeline of, okay, now how do we make that more efficient and scalable? And so, in fact, we're looking to AI to try to help us take brain images and find the signals that actually become objective outcomes. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And the problem with psychiatry is we don't necessarily have thousands of retinographies to look at. We have many imaging studies have been 40 people, 50 people. Now there's a whole movement in the field to combine all these data sets together. And there's a big enigma which is now done across neuropsychiatric disorders. But now we have like thousands of scans as opposed to 40, 50, 100. But that leads me to how much data do you need to even begin to develop testable models that you can then test in larger data sets? And I see that as one of the biggest challenges for psychiatry is do we actually even have the data in which to play in this game? And yet I would also argue to the room, we desperately need you. <laughs> and so can you work with us about how do we even get to step one here? Yeah, that, that's a good point. And, and this is why we, we are here, because um, in, in, in the neuroimaging field, there was um, 
this um, the scandal, so to say, about um, exaggerated yeah. correlation coefficients and stuff. And um, most studies are not like cross validated. So, um, and when we establish here a hidden um, data set, and the people come with their um, with their drops, say this um, ROI is indicative of depression. We can test this. If, if, uh, we establish this use case. We can test it and see if the model is good uh, or not. So, yeah. the, the, the number of that's a real unfortunate limitation. We have to overcome that in psychiatry if we can actually move forward. So, so this has now come up, and I'm very happy about it that, that people say we want to participate. Um, so, one practical way to figure things out is to type AI4H into Google, find everything there. We are a good acronym. Um, and there is the web page. In this way, you find the web page focused on artificial intelligence for health. And uh, that web page, if you go there, has uh, the result of the last meeting, and it has all the resources there. And uh, there's a process to uh, register. So maybe I give the microphone to Sim out here and explain it. Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, you did part of it by being here and probably registered for the meeting, so you created the ITU account and uh, uh, that you need to access the documentation for the focus group itself. So what we have today is an open forum for discussion, brainstorming of ideas and issues. And then there are these specific work items that you want to progress within the focus group uh, technical work uh, that we're going to be doing tomorrow and the day after. So we have a schedule of meetings. We have indicated there are future meetings, so you can take a look at the water planning. Uh, no, 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 it was perfect. Thank you. So uh, we have a meeting in PFL next uh, in, uh, in uh, Luzon uh, in January, and then another in Shanghai in the first week of April, and then another one in Geneva, located with the AI for Good. So these are opportunities for you know, engaging. The focus group is open to anyone, so you can participate and contribute and be part and uh, explore the opportunities for synergies. And uh, uh, I think Thomas mentioned this in the opening today. So just to uh, reinforce it as a message, it's an open group open to different uh, proposals. We're going to see uh, tomorrow and the day after a number of uh, use cases that are being proposed to be explored. Uh, we have the contributions in, in the process. So it's all, I think, an evolving and all, uh, no, we, we heard uh, several uh, interventions that say we want to be part of this process. Please be part of the process. It's open. It's, there is no, no the invitation is open, and uh, it's a question of following up the process and identifying the points of the intersection that we can help and, and contribute. So I think uh, uh, a lot of it is there on the outside, and uh, we are here to help to navigate that and how to better you know, engage with the specific points on how to, to participate in this process, but. Uh, it's open and uh, all are welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, stage is open for um, our last speaker, Nargis Razarian. And uh, she's a, an assistant professor at NYU, Lang Lang One or Lang One? Lang One. And um, you work at the interface of AI and medicine. And um, interestingly, um, I read a lot also not only electronic health records, but also pathology. Yes. Yeah. So. I try to do a little bit of that in the <laughs> Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, so I'm curious about what you're talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, so as Marco said, I'm an assistant professor in joint employment at the Department of Radiology and Population Health. And my background is uh, machine learning and computer science uh, during my PhD. It's only six years that I'm in this field. Um, something that I really uh, am excited about, my presentation, uh, just figure out the question. So, um, so I think it, will be, it, it has been raised a little bit uh, 
Data and AI go hand in hand, and uh, there's a reason that I continue to you know, stay in the health because something is changing about healthcare that I think uh, we, we, some of you already know, some of you would need to know about that. So first of all, we already very well know that digital footprints of data are just in many fields are accumulating. But something also happened in the US for sure since after 2008, the economy crashed. So there was a package to incentivize all the hospitals to try to save money, improve their operations, and you know it actually gave them a little bit of money if they switched to EHR. And that actually, uh, most major hospitals already had it, but the long tail of all of the other ones, that was when they started to switch to EHR. So uh, what is, uh, I see it's backward. So what is EHR? So EHR is uh, historically collecting all the healthcare interactions, any data that's collected in the system. And uh, so, what is You're holding it upside down. Oh, that's why it's backward. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So um, all the imaging results, let's say all the radiology scans are going to go in EHR. Every time we go to the doctor, whatever symptoms we describe, it's going to be in the doctor as a note somewhere and also as a structured data. Lab values, vital signs, everything is going to be here. So just to give you a little bit of a, what this really means in terms of number. So I'm at FLU and I only work with FLU data. NYU is in Midtown Manhattan. And uh, we also work, uh, actually, uh, there is a part of NYU which is in Brooklyn. So that's the population we have access to. And in the past very few years, since 2013, that's where like our system kind of changed a little bit and our data is accumulating. So this is a raw numbers of patients with different conditions that we have sitting there for free in our EHR data for several years now, five, six years, and every year it goes on. So for example, you can see we have about 400,000 patients with cancer. We have a lot of patients with cardio, uh, cardiovascular conditions. Uh, diabetes is in the endocrine disorders. We lost 800,000 patients, 10 million. Uh, visits and interactions. This number is actually quite valuable. And this is only in value. Every single hospital has it. And US is 300 million people, and we more or less all of us go to the doctor. Our data is now somewhere, and for free, it's available. So, what is kind of EHR? So, EHR is a time series, it's, uh, you know, it's a continuous time. It's uh, very sparsely captured, so we don't always collect the data, but sometimes we go to the doctor, and whenever we go, there is a wealth of data that's going to just accumulate. We have uh, free, net, free notes, that's a major source of where the information goes, it's text. And, um, but then there will be, as people, some people call it billing codes, but basically codes for diseases. There are 86,000 ICD codes for diseases that are possible. There is lab values, which are all coded with their units. Everything is captured, right? So, and uh, so in in my group and in my lab, uh, we identified one medical gap that we think uh, lends, uh, fits very well with AI and this data that we have access to, and it's early detection. There's I don't probably need to, uh, you know motivate why this matters for cancer, for cardiovascular diseases. If we can detect things early, we can do things about that. And so the way we, we can think about it, for those of you who might not have thought about it this way, is we look at some cohort of patients today, some of them have a condition, some of them don't. Because we have access to time, and that's so valuable, we just go back a few years when they just didn't have that condition yet. And we have these time series, so from a very broad way of thinking about it, we reveal whatever variable we care in the past uh, of this condition onset, and that would be our input. And then we also build our outcomes from the time that we care about. And in the middle is something that was mentioned. It converts from input to output. It's X to Y. It's machine learning. There's a lot of models out there, depending on what the input is, and that's kind of what uh, you know, the big framework fits very well in machine learning conferences, supervised learning keys, very well established. So the challenges that we actually have to face in terms of healthcare is 
Our data is multimodal, which means we have images, we have, uh, let's say, the Gallagher images, we have retina, we have the uh, pathology images, lots of images. We have uh, kids and we have lab surveys. We know the lab value five years ago, four years ago, three years ago, how it changed all the lab values. And uh, so, and also the notes. Uh, our data is biased. Patients only go to the doctor when they're sick. So that's important to remember. And we also have to explain the decisions as was very well established. But uh, in my group and in this talk, for now, we are tackling the first of it. Our group is kind of young, so we are just like doing one step at a time. And I will just give you a touch on what it means to deal with each of these mortalities. What is the, how far can we push each of them? Right, so the first one, as I mentioned, is structured data. And it is, this is a collaboration with uh, my students and my collaborators, and uh, it's very close to our heart. This, this topic is very important. Before mentioning anything, structured data, is something that goes into Excel and CSV file. Everybody, very easy to get it. It's relatively small, and it has time steps. And but it is extremely diverse. Just by itself, it, we have right now we are working with 280,000 different variables that are collected over time. If we only work with sparse arrays, everything, nothing fits if you just open them up. But it's okay. And for every disease possible, there's a code for it. We can create a feature for it. Every procedure, every single type of procedure with each specialist, there's a code for it. All the lab values, right? So by themselves, they can be used. You don't need a GPU to use these ones to predict future diseases. And they have shown in one paper down here, which I don't, uh, I won't go into details. Feel free to read it. How you can even use claims data to predict diabetes a year or two in advance for a lot of uh, for six million uh, people actually actually so but uh, of course this is only the easy way and uh, straightforward no GPU nothing but we do have time so we can even extend our methods to having times and use variables over time again that's not the time to you know focus on the uh, details feel free to read the papers we can do uh, several architectures of deep learning convolution. And now then we are in combination of variables. But the point is to go from this structured data over time to future diseases. And we have evaluated, we are now have, we call it an engine, but basically once you define your outcome in some time window, and you kind of define what window you want it to be, uh, uh, you know, the input, you can start to evaluate and sort diseases according to which ones are predictable. And what, uh, what's really exciting is uh, now acting on this. We already have this value, and we're talking with our care coordination units to go and act. Something that's interesting is uh, this is a short-term uh, disease prediction. We're predicting only uh, six to uh, 18 months into the future. So we have six months to do something. And usually, uh, cardio, actually, uh, congestive heart failure, kidney failure, and lots of conditions are consistently become more and more predictable. So we are focusing on those right now to prevent it. There are things to do, we can do it. These are all the projects that I'm involved in this context. And I, uh, I guess it, it's the, the number of projects. Topics that you can think about is almost infinite. Now, um, one issue that we have is that we also have to deal with text because there's the criticism of structured data that, and not everything gets coded and the things you know what? Yes, that's true, and you know where that information goes. It's going to be in the text. This is a very briefly another project which we are trying to decode medical notes because people are working with them, so we have to learn to use them. This is an example of a medical note. Okay, so um, most existing natural language methods don't really work on these because that's not the note, what the note was written for. Notes are written in a hurry. Uh, they are super information rich. They are full of abbreviations because why do you need to write the full thing if everybody in this field knows? Uh, there are misspellings, nobody has time to correct spellings. There are um, actually um, also the same thing you can see here are phrases. There's a variety in there. Why would you bother to write the was or is if, if it can be inferred, right? So it is not English. It's not intended to be and it will never be English. And that's, that's how it is. But still, it's readable by humans, so we should be able to develop metrics. So the first step in dealing with a language, whatever language it is, German, English, 
you know, French or medical languages, they have to understand what these terms mean. So that's what we have started to do. We, when you see green P, well, based on the context, we, are, we can infer that it is actually blood pressure. And if, you know, it drives you to that. This is called embedding. So we have actually uh, trained our embeddings and uh, we, we made it open source and free. So the common terms that, that have more than certain frequency, we know that they are, you know, with good accuracy, with uh, good confidence, we know that they identify it, we can release them. So we are releasing about 25,000 medical terms with their embeddings. And they are covering like these kind of terms, like ABD, which stands for abdominal, or XR is X-ray, things like that. Okay, so, and a lot more. And uh, so again, it's, once you know what terms means, all right, the door opens to a variety of methods in terms of uh, deep learning. And these are actually pretty standard methods in computer science conferences nowadays, and there are even more uh, models out there. We just try to, and one thing I can mention is that uh, at the moment, NLP models do not deal with numbers inside the text, but in medical field, if you have that temperature of blood pressure in the text, that number matters. So our methodology actually pulls that data out and tries to infer information with that. Right, so again, uh, you can uh, read the paper, the details of the paper out here. As I said, we consistently see that uh, uh, kidney failure and heart failure and stroke are pretty predictable based on our model. So we actually use these three as our candidates to try to predict uh, how well can we predict them, and we are acting on this. And finally, we have images. Uh, that is part of our EHR, so we have to deal with that. And um, so we heard a little bit about the image space is very large. There's so many things that can help with the patient. Uh, we have a couple of projects, only one of them I could talk about in this short time, which is about histopathology. So uh, this is a collaboration with pathology department, bioinformatics, and we recently published uh, our results in nature medicine. And we are really excited. So what we are looking at is lung cancer, uh, which is the most killer cancer, uh, in fact, at the moment. It's right after breast and prostate cancer in uh, women and men. And uh, right now, there are some exciting therapies, uh, getting some approvals in stages of clinical trial, for example, immunotherapy. So there is a lot of value if we can uh, find out the gene mutation that the lung cancer has or the subtype. And that's what we start to look at. So we look at, uh, um, so let me actually briefly tell you that the data we use is uh, publicly available. It's called, it's from an initiative called TCGA. They have uh, collected about 32,000 uh, patients, primarily all cancer patients. They have uh, scanned their uh, 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 tumors, basically. They have done genomics, uh, sequencing, RNA sequencing, all sorts of valuable data. That's all we use for this work, and we evaluate it on our data. And what we uh, we tried is that we uh, we actually use a very simple architecture, it's inception. That was our starting architecture to try to look at this slide, which is a tumor cut under the microscope as an input, and the output is what are the mutations and what are the subtypes of the cancer. And Funny thing is that we are pretty good at building architecture, so we started with this baseline inception, and we were ready to invent on top of it, but our baseline worked so well. Uh, with the AUC, we can actually differentiate uh, the lung cancer subtypes with 97 AUC, and also with just detecting the cancer itself compared to normal is 99 AUC. So. And it uh, it generalizes. Let's see if I have it. it. It generalizes very well. It's all in the paper to NYU data as well. So very exciting work. And uh, also we can also predict the mutation uh, of these uh, slides right from the image, which it saves a lot of data. In some environments, they don't have access to you know high-end genomic sequencing. There is uh, some interesting uh, signal in the images. And the data, all the instruction. All the code is open source. And that's it. So I guess I just gave you a touch of a couple of things that could happen. This EHR that is accumulating is going to be a great source and it's going to change the way we are going to uh, predict or improve you know, the 
classification. It's going to change the way we derive hypotheses. It's going to change the way we recruit for clinical trials. And um, first, uh, following it, it's going to change how we uh, develop treatments. Also, there are so many tasks that are good methodologies already available. It's supervised learning. In the next five, six, five to ten years, I think we're just going to see many, many useful developments between different modalities, and each of them is going to save lives, it's going to save money, it's going to be useful somewhere. And uh, I guess I just uh, emphasize that we are, we have pushed, you know, toward getting good accuracy. The next step is putting it in the system and actually starting to use, and that is the next challenge that probably our field needs to face. So that's it. Uh, thanks for listening. <laughs>
Thanks for that question. I think it's a very, very important and persistent question that keeps on coming to us and I'm going to also. Uh, this is science good. Uh, the technology is creating all this. this I'm, I'm going to make a slide about it. So, but, yeah. but there is, as you said, so I think that's so the challenge for all this world. It's not just the solutions, but the users also look at system-based solutions. I mean, we have uh, in our program that come from use a health of information, health of systems as a cohort of the group and look at simple solutions for diabetes. We have modules where we are helping health coaches who are not trained on the systems to learn through distance learning. But I mean, this is a challenge for us, which I think has yeah, this, this uh, addressed. Yeah. A lot of the focus is on okay. the business model to the patient or the user directly. The systems approach is not there. And the question on business model has come up. I think that's where the interesting part of the governance would be. If we have a systems approach, uh, the governance would be more inclined towards the business models and applying support. So I think it's a very good point. And some people just going to keep thinking um, as you go forward. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. So let's look in the pigeon hall. I think. Yeah, have to work. So how can electronic health records from different institutions potentially proprietary be used for validating, assessing solutions, and be actually used? Maybe this goes to you, I guess. Well, um, it goes a little bit beyond uh, um, my expertise, but uh, there is something called, first of all, there's something called health information exchange, which is coming with these incentives that has happened. Uh, it's, it's in the US. They are trying to make uh, data interchangeable, basically. It's a big, big, big investment. It, it's probably taking very long time to finalize, but 10 years from now, that is. Okay. But I guess at this time, uh, everything is a silo, more or less. But uh, I guess I could mention that there, is, um, there are some initiatives to standardize this vocabulary in EHR. Like when somebody codes it in this way, like glucose would have different names. So there's something called uh, OMOP, uh, which actually people at Columbia are highly involved in. It's a standard for each chart, which uh, if each institute converts their data to that uh, format, um, showing the model, those models are exchangeable, actually. So that might be the short-term solution why people figure out this uh, information exchange initiative. Um, there is a government effort to really promote interoperability. I think it's one of the things that we feel that we missed the boat on with the HIT stimulus package. We didn't force companies like Epic and Turner to really do the work to make themselves interoperable. And honestly, health systems are not particularly motivated to do that either. There's real, you know, we like to keep patients in your system. So I think we are seeing a push from the government to really break down those barriers. Okay. Are there questions from, from the audience, from the speakers? Um, I'm also not in the pigeon hall, so maybe we can rest a bit and have a coffee. Yeah. So the next um, session begins at quarter past 11. So. Thank you very much, and uh, let's thank the speakers. Again.